Uh, good afternoon, all. I'd like to welcome you to our first lunchtime talk today as part of Disability Awareness Week. Uh, today we have Ian Streets from About Access Limited. Ian is going to um, talk to us about uh, basic awareness in relation to some changes that we can make within buildings to become more accessible and inclusive. Ian has a wealth of experience with over 20 years of experience to date and a range of different uh, fields in relation to accessibility. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ian Strix. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the idea of today's talk is just look at some things that are relatively easy to do. Um, when I'm doing access audits, I come across all sorts of things and some are more complex than others and some require more building works to be undertaken. Uh, so I thought the idea of this afternoon's presentation would be just some quick wins that can be done. Um, it might be around management. It might be if you've just got somebody that's a good handyman, might be able to make these alterations. <clears throat> Nothing that is too onerous. Um, there's a couple of times when I will touch on technical items, um, but really just to give you a bit of a flavour and a bit of a background of uh, different areas and perhaps how we measure various things. So I will go into screen sharing and we will make a start. So hopefully, slideshow from start, hopefully you can all see that. So my name's Ian Streets, um, well let's get into it. Um, you start from the externals to the building and I just thought we'll just pick up on some seating to start with because generally we don't give it much thought uh, but we ought to give it pay more attention to it than we do. Here we've got a park and this particular bench looked out over a, a little mere um, where there was some paddle boats and one or two other things. And the reason why I've picked this one is that well, we ought to be able to have a wheelchair user sit alongside us. Uh, might be husband, wife, might be son and daughter, um, just friends, and you're out in a wheelchair. Person who's using the wheelchair has to sit in front of the bench, which means the person sat on the bench is looking at the back of the companion. So next time we're thinking about providing some benches or upgrading our seating, just provide a space alongside, you know, about 1200 millimetres wide, but just wide enough so a wheelchair user can get alongside and two people can sit side by side. It's much more a pleasant experience. And here we've uh, got another photograph. This is from, um, this is in Northern Ireland, and this was some seating that had been put in in a, a refurbished area. This was um, Lisbon. And you can see that we've got some armrests, which are really good. You still can't approach from the ends, unfortunately. It does project a little bit. So again, if you're out with somebody using a wheelchair, it could be parents with kids in prams and buggies. They've got to sit in front of you. They can't sit alongside you. We have got armrests and we've got backrests, which are important. Now, if you've got a lot of seating, I'm not suggesting that all the seats need to have armrests and backrests, but you need a good mix so people can have an option because people do use the armrests to sit down and get themselves up from a seated position. The other thing with bench seating is it's good practice if the armrests aren't at the end. We can see with this. Um, we we'll see with this one. We've got the armrests just at the end here. Well, if we just set those in one seat width, it means a wheelchair user can get alongside and can transfer to the bench if that's what they want to do. It just gives a few more options. So, just things worth thinking about with external seating. Same with picnic tables. Think about those. How many times do you go to a, a park or somewhere like that? And if you've got 
a wheelchair user with you or you've got kids in prams and buggies it's not inclusive you know you're not all sat around the table together which is what we want to be able to do this table isn't too bad at the end uh, a child in a pram or a wheelchair user can sit at the end and this is a better design than some benches that I've seen where you will get the supports which will actually come right at the end they'll come down here and while that creates a problem is that to sit at the bench facing the table you've got to lift your legs over those supports and not everybody can do that so again just think about the design of any picnic benches or any outdoor tables that you're putting here we've got another one much more accessible you can slide into the benches from the side wheelchair users children in prams they can all approach to the approach the table from the side it's about all being able to sit together the other thing that we haven't got here is we haven't got real good access to the benches it's right across grass and at times that can be problematical the grass can be uneven it can be rutted it could be muddy so think about the surface around the picnic benches and again if you've got a lot of them i'm not suggesting that they all have to have a firm and even surface to them good if it would but at least have some benches where you've got a firm surface leading to them and underneath the benches it just helps everybody so that's just about picking the right furniture when you're renewing it or when you're buying some furniture steps now there's not a lot there's no quick wins about redesigning these steps these steps are appalling in terms of accessibility they present a lot of problems but there's things that can be done just thinking about the handrail to start with we've got the handrail just at the back here which offers very poor tonal contrast handrails need to be obvious so again if we're thinking about quick wins if you've got a hand demand facilities management team there's no reason why that can't be painted another colour the same with nosings these steps the nosings are very difficult to identify we'll just highlight them there and that's going to create a possible tripping hazard up or down the stairs so again i had a discussion earlier on with uh, a group of people about nosings and putting new nosings in what's the best way to do it and a couple of ways you can look at it one you can paint the nosings on you can get epoxy paints two packs uh, that you mix together very hard wearing you can put aggregate in them uh, to make them slip resistant so you can paint those on and they will last a reasonable length of time or you can get pre-made nosings which you can secure which you can screw into the steps and either will work so again both of those are relatively easy to do but they just help an awful lot of people use the steps the other thing with handrails we've only got one here we should have handrails to both sides some people will only have strength down one side they might have had a stroke and brain injury uh, and just got strength so if they've only got strength on the right hand side and they need to take support from a handrail whether they're going up or down a flight of steps if there's a handrail only on one side it creates a problem for them in this example in this photograph we've got the handrail on the right hand side when you're going down so if you've only got strength on the right hand side it's great when you're going down you can hang onto the handrail but what do you do when you come back up so again provide handrails to both sides not difficult to apply um, somebody competent will be able to put a second handrail in there we've just covered three things at the moment and just before i rattle on and get into my full stride anybody any questions at the moment no it's fine right good right we'll crack on um still with the external steps we've got a flight here where they have put contrasting nosings which do work 
I'm not suggesting for a minute that the world has to be covered in black and yellow hazard tape or white nosings everywhere. You can use whatever colour you want, providing there's good tonal contrast, providing the standout. You might use corporate colours. No reason why you can't, providing they do the job and make the nosing, make the edge of the step obvious. Here we've got handrails both sides and you can just see at the top, they just level out uh, at the top of the steps, which is what we should be looking at with handrails, because this helps people take support before they start climbing or going down the steps. They're on the level, they might be unsteady on the feet. So if we can get hold of support while we're on that level, it does help enormously. The other thing we've got missing to these steps, and it's perhaps not a, a quick win, but we should have tactile warning at the top and bottom of the steps. And again, that's going to be a bit more involved in the work. Would be good if you could provide it externally, but certainly in these examples, providing contrasting nosings and handrails to both sides is a, a must. This is all about management of the environment. And again, it's not difficult this, but it's just thinking about where people are going. The picture on the left, we've got a, a tree just growing across the path. Somebody that's visually impaired, sweep of a cane, got a, a guide dog with them, and never going to pick up those overhanging branches. They're going to walk straight into them. So we ought to be monitoring the vegetation around the paths, whether it's a park, playground, even the high streets and thinking, well, those branches are getting a bit low, we ought to get them cut back. And that's what should have happened here with uh, this branch, these branches coming across the path. Photograph on the, the right, we've got the handrail. I, I think this is pretty obvious. One, the bush is starting to hide the handrail. There's very poor tonal contrast with it. But even ignoring that, People are going to be reluctant to use that handrail because you're going to brush up against the vegetation. You might get wet, you might get leaves and branches stuck on you. So again, it's just offering good customer service in essence, making sure that everything is cut back so that you can access the routes. You haven't got any tripping hazards. Parking. It's important that if you have got parking, we do provide accessible parking bays. Uh, we've got a, a picture here from a museum in Northern Ireland. We've got two accessible parking bays. It's great. We've got the hatching to one side. We should have hatching at the rear. Uh, so if somebody's getting in a wheelchair out the back of the car, they've got that safe zone to do that. And we should also have a post mounted sign the reason why I want the post mounted sign is so that when there's snow on the ground or the ground markings get worn or there's leaves on the ground, you can still readily identify the parking bay. It also helps when you arrive in the car park, it's easy to identify the accessible bays. The other thing that often gets a lot of people's backs up is you go into a car park and the car park is chock-a-block. All the spaces are taken except there's 10 accessible parking bays not being used. And this annoys a, a fair number of people. Um, I can understand why, I can appreciate that. But this is where, as a service provider, somebody operating out of a building with a car park, we should be thinking about how many parking bays have we got? And we should be monitoring the use of the parking bays. So a couple of times a day, and I don't mean at eight o'clock in the morning and at five o'clock at night when everybody's either not got to work or to the site or going home, but perhaps midday, mid-afternoon, something like that, have a look to see how many of the parking bays are actually being used and monitor it over a reasonable period of time. That then gives you the evidence to either increase the number of parking bays if they're all being used or regularly all being used. You think, well, actually, possibly not providing enough, we ought to add to it. Or, well, actually, there's an argument there that we can reduce the number. And it might be that you provide 10 accessible parking bays, but only three or four are ever used. Well, I wouldn't suggest you cut it back to four, but you might cut it back to six. So you've still got a bit of slack in the system. 
but you need the evidence to do that. You shouldn't be doing it just on a whim. And you still need to monitor the base going forward, making sure you're providing the right number. There is guidance to tell you how many parking bays you should provide as a percentage. And this is a museum. And here, for example, we should be providing 6% of the total parking bays should be for uh, blue badge holders. And we've just got a diagram here on the right of what we should be looking for with an accessible bay. When you look at the building regulations, technical documents, you will often see that the bay only shows hatching to one side. What that means is that depending who's getting out of the car and who's driving the car, means you've either got to drive into the bay or you've got to reverse into the bay to make sure that hatching is on the, the side for them to get in and out of the car. And again, it might not just be a wheelchair user. Thinking of me, my mum, for example, she's unsteady on her feet and she struggles to bend her legs to get in the car. So I've got to make sure that the car door is wide open as possible so she can get in. So that space alongside the hatched area is very, very important. And we provide that hopefully to keep other car drivers from parking in it, not like we've got in this photograph where we've got the grey car just encroaching into that hatch space. The idea is that drivers are aware and just keep clear of it. Any questions on parking? No. no. Right. Entrances. Okay, we've got an entrance here. There's not a lot you, there's no quick wins to be had about this. Uh, the pass door, that's the, the side hung door on the left there, and the revolving door. In this instance, is too narrow. It's 800 mil, it should be 1,000. There's no quick win. But what we can ensure is that when people come to this building, that door is readily available. If the revolving door is always unlocked and anybody that can use it can walk up to it, go straight through, the same should apply with the, the side hung door, the pass door. It's surprising how many times you will come to buildings with entrances like this, where the pass door, you've got to knock on the glass, you've got to use an intercom, get hold of reception or security to come and unlock the door. That shouldn't be the case. This is down to management of the building. And it's just about ensuring that everybody has equal access. Why should somebody with an assistance dog have to wait outside for that door to be unlocked? because everybody else can go through the revolving door. They shouldn't. It's all about being fair and everybody having the same chances. So, what colour is your weather map? Has anybody ever given it a thought about going into a building and thinking about the weather map? What colour is it? Well, here we've got a, a cafe with an outdoor seating area and they've got a dark weather mat. Somebody with a cognitive impairment might have had a stroke with brain injury, might have dementia. Somebody visually impaired may perceive that dark weather mat as either a change in level or a hole. So we would need to think about that and provide weather mats that have similar colours, similar tonal contrast to the flooring that it's laid on. The same applies with lifts. We don't want lifts with a dark floor. Because again, visually impaired people, people with cognitive impairments might perceive that as an open lift shaft. So just give that some thought. These are quick wins, easy to do. Um, here we've got another entrance. Yes, we've got a dark weather mat, but it's all around the entrance. It's not just a small area. So the chances of somebody perceiving that as a whole is going to be very slim. Now, they might perceive the change between the blue and the wooden floor. They might perceive that as a step, but certainly entering the building shouldn't be an issue there. Uh, the picture on the uh, right there is, um, I think it's Newton Ards Art Gallery, Ards Art Centre. Reception 
receptions and the sales counters. Here we've got a sales counter in a historic property and they've plonked the sales counter directly in front of the window. And I couldn't take the photographs square on, I wanted to, but because the light was so bright, it just wasn't going to work. And that's the same problem that somebody with a visual impairment uh, might have. Also, it could be a problem to somebody who's hearing impaired. Why do you think the bright light coming from behind a receptionist or somebody on the sales counter, why might that be a problem to somebody that's hearing impaired? Any idea? Unable to lip read. I beg your pardon? If they can't lip read the, the person across the desk. So I, I missed that, but I'll, I'll say that um, it casts the face into the shadow. So that if you're stood in front of the window serving a customer, your face is in shadow. So it then makes lip reading or observing facial expressions very difficult. And if you're hearing impaired and you're relying upon that, you've got a problem. It's just another barrier to, to try and overcome. So we want reception desks without having bright lights, spotlights shining on the face of customers, big windows like this. Also, if you're doing a tour, if your organization gives tour of country houses, just think about where the guides stand and give out information. Do they stand in front of a large window and say, well, look at the gardens behind me. Aren't they beautiful? And if the sunlight is pouring in through that window, it then makes it very difficult for everybody to, to have a look and see what that person is seeing. So just give that some thought. Here we've got a, a school and in terms of the desk's placement, it ticks all the boxes. We've got a relatively plain background apart from the name of the school. Lighting is good. Um, this was taken at half term, hence the boxes and the bits and pieces on the, the floor. But the location is all right. You're going to get staff. The faces are going to be evenly lit. You're going to be able, able to lip read, see facial expressions. Now, I don't know if we've got anybody on uh, any hoteliers or b, b owners or do any work with any of those. But how many times have you guys been to a hotel and been asked, do you require any assistance in the event of an emergency? My work takes me all around the country and I've stopped in many hotels and I reckon I can count on one hand the number of times that question I've been asked. It might be that you're an extremely heavy sleeper and that the fire alarm isn't enough to wake you up. You may, might be profoundly deaf. So you should be asking at reception when somebody's booking in, do you require assistance? It might be that they've got a prosthetic leg and yes, they do require assistance in the middle of the night because they're not going to be quick at getting up. So that question should be asked much more than it is. We also want an induction loop at the counter. Um, we can just see that we've got a sign just at the back here to say that we've got an induction loop. That is what we're looking for. And where you've got receptions, sales counters, fixed points of contact within a building with members of the public, you should be having a hard wired system. It is not sufficient to have a portable system and say, we'll get it out when somebody asks. Well, by then it is too late. They're not expensive. I reckon an induction loop at this counter will be two or three hundred quid, something in that order. So we're not talking mega bucks here. Easy to install and just up, just turn it on as part of the opening up process and just ensure it's checked regular. Now then, horizontal circulation. Important that people can move around the building. Uh, one of the key things about that is good signage. Uh, signage just helps so many people uh, that we ought to give it perhaps much more thought than we do. And actually this photograph was 
just taken last week on a job that I did last Monday. And I couldn't believe what I saw. Where do you start reading the signs? There are just so many. And actually, an awful lot of them are very similar or all say the same thing. It's just repeating itself time and time again. All those that I've just highlighted all say the same thing. We just don't need that many signs. Somebody's gone mad. Um, we've also got some information at the bottom here. Uh, it did have names on it, but I've just deleted the names purely for confidentiality reasons, but it did say which department was where. So if you're providing signage, and if you, as we are at the moment with COVID, we're doing a lot of improvised signage, homemade signage, things like that, don't use all uppercase letters. We should be using either sentence case or we use a capital letter, uppercase letter for each word. We read by word shape. It is the easier way your words have got shape to them. All these signs are all in uppercase, which doesn't help. And we've just got information overload. That is going to be a problem to a lot of people. Here we've got another sign. Um, this was at a, a museum in uh, Northern Ireland. And, oops, the, the signs are embossed, so you can touch read them. They also include Braille. I don't know if you can just make it out along there. There's a bit of Braille, oops. And can't quite make that one out, but there you can just see the identifier, which is what a, a visually impaired person will look for if they're going to read Braille, so they can identify where the Braille is. Now, Braille is, its use is on the decline. Um, that is because of a lot of people have smart mo smartphones, modern technology. Uh, it's not being totally without use. There are places where I would still recommend it is used. Buttons to lift and on toilet doors. Some good places where it can be provided. If you're providing it on a sign as we've got here, how does the person who uses Brill know the sign has got Brill? How do they know the sign is there? So if you're going to put Braille on your signs, just think about where you're putting it. Where's the sign going? Is it in a safe place for people to stop and touch read the sign? I went in one building and they had fire emergency evacuation signage that was in Braille and it was at the top of the stairs. Great place to stand and read it and get pushed down the stairs as everybody comes running past you to evacuate. So give it some thought where you put in your, your signage. Doors. We all come across doors within buildings. And are they readily identifiable? We've got this glass screen here. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there is a door in the middle of the glass screen. I had a great week last week. The two buildings that I did, I've got quite a few of their slides in this presentation because it was just, it was horrendous from an accessibility point of view. But uh, that is where the door is doesn't stand out and again it can be a quick win all it needs is some further manifestation of a different color adding to the door and manifestation by the way is permanent marking on glass it's not sticking a notice on with blue tack or sellotape it's applying um, a design to the glass however you do that and that perhaps to remove it you've got to get a scraper to pull it off it won't just fall off and we should be using two colors that totally contrast when you put in manifestation on glass and what we do here is the just the door itself those bands that are on there it would be better if they were just a different color from the rest so it stands out there's also an issue here with this door. It opens into the room with it being glass. It's very difficult to identify the leading edge. It would be very easy for a visually impaired person to walk into that or even anybody that's just not looking where they're going. So the quick win there would be 
They're having the doors open because of COVID. They wanted to reduce the number of touch points throughout the building. Well, let's put a table in front of the door edge, put a chair in front of it. It's not going to be there forever, but it just helps identify that edge and just stop people walking into it. Here we've got a, a toilet door. This ticks all the boxes for me. Um, the door is readily identifiable. We've got the wall there that's a pale colour and we've got a dark green door. Total contrast, that is absolutely brilliant. That is really going to stand out. There are a couple of ways that we, you can look at ensuring the door stands out. We can do as we've got here, have the door a strong tonal contrast with the wall. That's great. That's a big feature that somebody with sight loss is going to easily identify. Or you could paint the wall or paint the door the same colour as the wall and just have the architrave, the border to the door, paint that dark green and that would still work. But that is going to take a little bit more time for somebody with sight loss to identify. So I would use that example in uh, an office environment, for example, where everybody gets familiar with the building and it becomes easier to identify because you know where you're going. Whereas a public space, I would go for this option and ensure the door itself provides a contrast. This was a project I did recently, a couple of toilet doors. I don't know what you think. Do you think they provide good tonal contrast? There's not a lot of difference between the, the doors and the walls, but a quick win, a quick cheat, convert the photograph to black and white. That will help you identify the tonal contrast. And that's the bit that we're thinking about is tonal contrast. And when you convert it to black and white, you can see there is negligible difference between the wall and the doors. So further tonal contrast is required. And I, I thought I would add this in, we're just getting a bit technical, um, but I just thought it would just, you, you might find it interesting. I hope so anyway. Uh, one of the things we talk about is light reflectance volume, LRV. And LRV is the amount of light reflected by the colour. This is why I keep talking about tonal contrast rather than colour contrast, because there is a difference. And the LRV scale runs from naught, which is black, to 100, which is white. Now, you will never get naught and you'll never get 100. You'll get close to them, but you'll never get those figures. And there is guidance around what you need to do. So where lighting levels are good and strong, 200 looks or more, large areas want 20 points difference. And I'll explain this a bit more in a minute. Door furniture, you only need 15. That doesn't need to be so strong because the door handle has got 3D shape to it. It's got shadow to it, so it is easy to identify. Text on signs, there should be 70 points difference. So the words you put on a sign, the colour you use there, the LRV value should be 70 points between that and the surface the text is written on. Excuse me. And where lighting levels are a little bit poorer, less than 200 lux, you want 30 points difference on the larger areas. So we'll, that is what we're, we're generally looking for. But on the next slide, this is where you get your information from, because I can imagine one of the questions you've got is, well, how do we find out what the LRV value is? Well, if you get yourselves a colour chart, and this is from Dulux, they are free, or the manufacturers are available, they will give you that information. And on this photograph, it is the 83 is that digit in front of the slash, that is the LRV value of that colour. So that colour there, GY93, the LRV value is 83. Going down to the bottom, that pale green there, the LRV value is 49. And it's the difference between those two numbers is what we talk about when we're looking for LRV values and the difference. So we could put those two colours together because the difference between the 83 and the 49 is 34 points. So if the lighting levels were less than 200 lux, you could say have the walls, the top colour, GY93, that pale colour, and you could put your door 
or the architrive, the other colour, the 70GY. Um, actually, they're all 70GY, but they're, sorry, they're the darker colour at the bottom. You can put those two colours together and you've got sufficient tonal contrast. When you go and buy paints, you should be able to find out what the LRV value is. If you're using a contractor, tell them you want a magnolia on the floor, uh, on the walls, and you want a darker colour on the doors, and ask them what the LRV values are. Again, it's not difficult, it is something that you can be easily done. You can also use the colour chart to identify what your LRV values are of existing colours on the walls at the present time. There's also other information that you'll find in a pack and that deals with the hue and the chroma, which we're not bothered about. It is purely the LRV value that we're interested in. Any questions on what I've just talked about? We've got a bit technical, I know. Ian. Any questions? Hi Ian, sorry, it may not, this question's not directly towards that very uh, technical piece of information, which is very useful, but I'd like to invite Rachel. Rachel had a question in regards to your last uh, slide that you had, if I could um, invite Rachel to ask her question, is that okay, Ian? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Ian, it was more around the signage. I know you uh, said that people were using their smartphones. Is it something we should start incorporating like a QR code, especially with the COVID people are trying not to touch surfaces? Yeah, QR codes work very well. But again, somebody that's visually impaired, it's making sure where you place them so they can find the QR code. Yeah. Um, it might be one that you actually put on a website that you have a QR code on there so they can open up and they get more information rather than having to read it, or you provide QR codes around the building. Um, QR codes would be good for, uh, if you're a museum, for example, and you know how you put a little plaque next to a painting about the history of the painting, who painted it, all the rest of it, a little QR code there, just giving that information would be very good. That's brilliant. And that's, I wanted to check, because obviously with the same Braille being used less and less, so I thought maybe yeah. that would be an idea too. But brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Right, so doors. The other thing with doors is how heavy are they? And we've all got a tool with us. It's our little pinky, our little finger. And the rule of thumb is if you can easily open the door with your little finger, chances are the door weight is going to be absolutely fine. Now, I use my non-dominant hand. I'm right handed. So I use my left hand and I find that if I can easily open the door with my little finger, the door weight is about right. I do carry a tool. I do carry a spring balance that measures in newtons where I, I need to do that. Um, but generally, I do a quick test with my little finger. Can I open the door? And if I can, it's fine. You can adjust doors with door closers. They can be adjusted. There's a slide on the top and there's uh, one or two screws in there. They all do it slightly different that you can adjust just to reduce the door weight. Still stopping with doors. And again, we've got another tool with us. We've got our clenched fist. Can you open the door with a clenched fist? How many times have you gone into the office and you've got a load of books or you've got bags in your hand and you've actually used your knee to open the office door to push down the lever handle? Same thing applies. Can you use your fist? Can you use your elbow? Here we've got an oval handle. That is going to be very difficult to operate. So we ought to be having something more like this, a lever handle. Now the picture on the left, yes, it is an historic building. And there might be an argument that says we can't change the door handle. But I don't see why we can't in certain locations throughout the building, not all of them, but just some of them. Why can't you use a brass lever handle? You're still in keeping with the design, but at least you're making the building a bit more accessible, a bit more user friendly. And I just thought I'd add this slide in, just getting technical. We often talk about clear effective widths, um, certainly as access professionals, and I wanted to just show you how 
we measure that and what we mean by the clear effective width. And if we just look at the diagram on the left, we've got two single leaf doors. We take account of the door furniture. So where the door opens at 90 degrees, you measure from allowing for the door handle across to the door frame. And it is that, it is that width that is the important bit. And again, with this door, the door doesn't open fully because of the wall. So it is the bit across here that we are measuring. It's not the width from there to there. We don't measure that width, which I have seen done in the past, which the distance from there to there is clearly a lot more from there to there. It's measuring the door head on. So if you're approaching the door and you're going straight on through it, it's that clear width that we want. And on double doors, it is one leaf that we measure. It is the main leaf in use. If you're a wheelchair user and you're going through double doors and the door, door leaves are narrow, you've got to push them both open and then you've got to hope you can get through the door quicker than both the leaves coming back and making a meeting in the middle. So you just need to be mindful of that. That was a doorbell going in the background. Joys of working from home. Right, vertical circulation. We're coming back to our stairs again. And the same things apply. There is just one difference that I did want to mention here. We do need contrasting nosings. We do need handrails both sides. But internally, and a good example of what we want, internally we do not use tactile warning at the top and bottom of a flight of steps. Uh, there are very, very, very few occasions where you would use it internally. Um, you use it outside, but not internally. But again, as I said earlier on, that we're getting into a bit more building works, trying to install tactile warning. And that wasn't the aim of this session. Again, it would not be difficult to add contrasting nosings to those wooden steps or provide a handrail on the side wall. Lifts, oh, coming back to signage again, but how do you know when the lift door opens, what floor level you're on? From within the lift car, you should be able to identify what floor you're at. Also applies to stairs. When you're going up the stairs and you get to the floor level landing, do you know what floor you've arrived at? Now, frequently I will see floor level signage on the main staircase, but it's very rarely provided to emergency staircases, and it should be. Floor level signage, wherever it is within the building, just helps people orientate themselves within the building. For example, you take somebody who's blind, partially sighted, uses the lift, goes to the fifth floor. Do they know how many floors the building has got? Do they know it's a 10 story building? It might be like a, a Manhattan, uh, skyscraper might have 30 or 40 floors. You need the floor level signage to identify where you are. And it doesn't matter whether you've only got a ground on the first floor, we should still be providing that signage. On this photograph, not the most attractive of signage. This was in a court building, but we clearly know we're at the lower ground floor and we've also got some directions telling us where courts 15 and 16 are and where court 14 is. And that's all it needs to be. Still stopping with lifts, a mirror on the back wall. Does anybody know why we have a mirror on the back wall? Well, if the lift is particularly small or the minimum size, or you can't turn around in the lift, the mirror on the back wall is very helpful to wheelchair users to identify what floor level they're at because there should be a floor number on the wall opposite the lift door, but also who they're going to run over when they reverse out the lift. The problem we've got here, uh, and I did this audit with, I was accompanied by a wheelchair user, the lift goes all the way to the ground floor to ceiling. If you're visually impaired, that can be confusing. I'm involved in an access group in Hull and Ron, who's a member, is visually impaired. He's gone 
into a lift many times and had a conversation with himself because of a floor to ceiling lift. He thought somebody else was in there. So the mirror wants to start at 900 millimeters above the floor. The other reason why the mirror wants to start there, and it was a prime example on the day I did this audit, the mirror on the back wall had been damaged and there was glass all over the floor. There's a chance with it going to the floor that the foot plates on the wheelchairs might catch the mirror and break it. But where still, the broken glass could lead to punctures on the wheels of the wheelchair, which clearly we don't want. So mirrors should only start from 900 mil above the floor of the lift. Just as we've got here, a good example of what we're looking for. With complete with me in the background. Toilets. Um, I'm just going to have to rattle on a bit because uh, I've done a bit too much talking. Again, we're coming back to clenched fist. Can you use a clenched fist to operate the taps? These are going to be very difficult. Here, this was a school. We've got motion sensor taps. These are a big benefit, but they also cause a problem to some people. If you're blind or partially sighted, how do you know how the tap is operated before you get water all over your sleeve? Somebody with a cognitive impairment might think, I know there's no tap to turn. How do I turn on the tap? So yes, they do help enormous, enormously, but they're not suitable for everybody. And here we've got the flush. How many times have we seen toilets with a push button flush? I do appreciate that this isn't going to be a quick win. You're going to have to get a plumber in. You're going to have to change the system. You're not going to do that overnight. But I just wanted to highlight the issue that push buttons, whether it's on the system lid, whether it's in the wall, does cause a problem. There are conditions out there where people cannot push buttons. The fingers will bend back. Um, or they don't have the manual dexterity to do that. They can only use a clenched fist. And with these buttons, you've got to depress the button beyond the surface, and it doesn't always work with a clenched fist. Same with cubital locks. We're thinking about a clenched fist. Can we operate them? And can we unlock the cubital door from the outside in the event of an emergency? I've just thrown this in for just a bit of a laugh. This was one of the first audits I did in Northern Ireland. And obviously the cubital wasn't big enough. So the joiner hanging the cubital door decided to take a notch out of the door so the door would swing past the toilet. But hey ho, interesting. But what we are talking about here is tonal contrast again. If you're visually impaired, how do you know if that toilet seat is up or down? Everything is white. So again, if the opportunity arises, replace your toilet seats with coloured ones. It just makes life so much easier. Here we've got a, a toilet seat, wood, we've got a lid. It's easy to identify. You know whether the toilet seat is up or down. Accessible WCs. The space on the side here, this area, is known as the transfer space. And that space needs to be kept free from obstruction. Wheelchair users who want to do a side transfer will back into that space. So having a wardrobe there, I know it is extreme, but having a wardrobe there prevents a wheelchair user from doing that. So that space wants to be free from all waste bins. Similar to what we've got here, this is more what we're looking for. The Toilet brush isn't so much of an issue, would be better if it's on the other side, but it's not a major issue there. Also, you will often find that sanitary bins will be in this area. They should be exactly where it is here. Accessible vending machine or vending machines. If you've got a vending machine in any of your toilets, ought to be replicated in the accessible WC. Not with a chair as we've got here, but we should be providing one. Where the dilemma comes is if you've got four items in the female toilets, four items in the male toilets, and they're all different, are you gonna put 
eight items in the accessible WC. No, you're not, because it needs to be a slim lamp machine. So you need to have a think about what items are essential and what are nice to have and just provide the essential items. It's a judgment call. Mention the alarm system. Frequently find these tied up. It is often the cleaners are the culprits because they don't like it hanging on the floor. And this one, I untied it, but they decided in the wisdom that it was hanging too low, so they've put some knots in it to keep it off the floor. The bottom bundle should be 100 mil off the floor. Paper towels, these are essential. There are people who will use the toilet and before they get changed or transfer back to the wheelchair, they need to reach the wash hand basin and wash and dry the hands. So the wash hand basin needs to be within distance, the WC pan, as does the soap dispenser, as does means to dry in your hand. Hot air dryers are nice to have. They're not essential. Paper towels are essential. Some people need to wash and dry body parts. You cannot do that with a hot air dryer. So this is what we should be providing. We've got paper towel dispenser here, soap dispenser here, and they're all within reach of the wash hand basin, which is what we're looking for. Now, again, I appreciate that moving the wash hand basin isn't a quick win, but providing soap and paper towel dispensers within reach of the wash hand basin is a quick win that can be easily achieved. I will put this diagram in showing you where everything should be. By the way, if you haven't got them already, these slides are available as a PDF if you want to, uh, so you've got the notes there as well. Want two clothes, clothes hooks at two heights, um, just helps everybody. Uh, we're back to our clenched fist. Can you lock the cubital door with a clenched fist? Because frequently I will come across accessible WCs that you can't. And again, this shouldn't be a difficult job to replace the door handle if it's one that doesn't meet what we're looking for. Here we've got a lever handle, dead easy to use with a clenched fist. Just thought I would show this photograph because um, it isn't something you come across very often, but this place does deserve a big round of applause. It is an art centre, performing centre, um, council offices in this building, and they had numerous accessible WCs in there, and they had a choice of transfer directions. Where you've got more than one accessible WC in a building, you should be providing different transfer directions. You should also identify what the transfer direction for each toilet. Now, if you think back to the photograph I showed you with the wardrobe in the transfer space, if you stand with your back to that wall and move to the toilet, you are moving to the left. So that is a left transfer. If the toilet was on the right and you stand in that big space with your back to the wall and you move to the right, that is a right transfer. And that's all this signage is doing. We've got the international symbol of access, the wheelchair, and we've got an L, which tells us that this toilet is a left transfer. So it would be good practice if you did provide that in your signage information around the building. And also provide it with the wayfinding signage. So where you've got the sign saying toilets to the left or toilets to the right, or upstairs or in the basement, whatever they are, and you've got a wheelchair accessible WC, that would also be a good time to say it's a left transfer or a right transfer. So if somebody has a need for a particular transfer, they know where to go. Anybody, any questions? Thanks. We want a mirror, and this should start at 600 millimetres above the floor. And please don't put, put it opposite the WC pan. Nobody wants to see themselves sat on the toilet. 
The other thing is shelves. Accessible WCs should have shelves. And in this diagram, we can see where the two shelves should be located. And I've just put this in for information purely, just so you know the details of a changing place facility. I'm not suggesting that this is a quick way, far from it, but this is what you're looking for in a changing place facility. And I just thought the information would be useful. Um, staff, you need to ensure that staff are given disability equality training. It is vital. Signage is something that's very important, uh, but also equally staff disability equality training. That can be that can make the difference between a business or an organisation being taken to court for discrimination or not. If staff show empathy and show understanding about the barriers to access that disabled people are facing, they can do an awful lot to calm the situation and perhaps learn from it and do something about it, which is the important thing. And emergency evacuation. When was the last time you checked your evacuation procedures from the building you normally work in? Are they accessible? The two buildings I did last week, they had no means of evacuating wheelchair users from the first from the upper floors. They were leaving wheelchair users and people who can't negotiate stairs in the refuge for the fire and emergency services to evacuate them. That is not how a refuge works. A refuge is a place of temporary safety, where if you've got a multi-storey building, somebody might wait in the refuge to let a lot of people pass so they can come down much slower, or it might be where a wheelchair user waits before they transfer to an evacuation chair. And while we're talking about evacuation chairs, they're not a panacea to get everybody out of a building who cannot use the stairs. Some people cannot transfer from their wheelchair to an evacuation chair. You will do them more harm than good. You take the late Stephen Hawkins, for example. If you picked him up and put him in an evacuation chair, he must probably would have done the guy an awful lot of damage. There are also some people who will not use an evacuation chair because they don't feel safe. They don't feel, feel as though they haven't got the trust in the people operating the chairs. It might also be that there are sufficient people within the building who are trained to use an evacuation chair. So you need to think about that and how you're going to evacuate people who can't use stairs. It's a management thing that needs to be given some thoughts ahead of the time that an evacuation may arise. So, any questions? I will come off, stop sharing the screen. So you can see me. There we go. Or I can see hi, you guys. Hi, Ian. I have a question for you um, with regards to um, wheelchair users who obviously are not um, comfortable or maybe for their own physical reasons are unable to use an evacuation chair. What do you recommend other than leaving, um, leaving them in a refuge area for the fire service to, to evacuate? What would you recommend? Well, first of all, we shouldn't be leaving them in a refuge for the emergency services to evacuate them. That is a no, no, don't work like yeah. that. But well, we know that, but I mean, what is the other recommendation? You know, if they can't use the evacuation chair, um, yeah. uh, so what, you know, what would you recommend? We can get stair climbers. It depends on the building uh, and what the building is designed like, but you can get stair climbers that will pick up the wheelchair and the wheelchair user and then bring them down the stairs in one go. But it depends how wide the staircase is as to whether that is feasible. You then also need to think about where is that piece of equipment going to be stored? And you need to make sure that it is fully charged for when it is needed. The other thing is your building may or may not, more than likely it won't have, but it might have evacuation lifts, which can be used in the emergency. Also, if the building has um, vertical rise platform lifts, 
Excuse me a minute, I'm just going up to. Sorry about that. Um, if you've got a vertical rise platform lift, that is a platform lift that goes straight up and down. It is possible for them to be used for emergency evacuation, providing it fulfills a number of criteria. One, when it's moving between floors, it runs on battery power. So it has a battery in it. And when it's parked up at the upper or the lower levels, the battery is being charged. A dynamic risk assessment has to be carried out at the time of the evacuation. And what that means is that if it's going to be used, a risk assessment has to be done at the time that you're not going to put somebody in danger by using the lift. And thirdly, building control needs to approve its use. And providing you can meet all those three, you can use a verticalized platform lift, whether it's a through floor or whether it's just a short rise for emergency evacuation. So it depends what's in your building. Does that, I mean, the other thing is also there should be a peep. And it might be a case of you do a peep for somebody who can't negotiate the stairs and they say, actually, I'm happy to come down the stairs on the bum one step at a time, providing somebody brings my wheelchair with me. They might be happy to do that, but you would have to have that conversation with them and you can't just assume that. Well, I suppose um, what I'm thinking of is um, if we had a performance, I'm sorry, I was late joining the meeting. My name's Jackie Doherty, I'm manager at the LA Theatre in Strabane. Right. And so, um, my apologies for that. Um, I suppose what I'm thinking about is if we have a customer in who yeah. is unable to, to use the evacuation chair, um, and I know we were unable to leave. I know a few years ago it, it seemed to be okay to be able to leave that person in the refuge area until the fire service arrived, but we know that has now changed. But I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's looking at an alternative solution, yeah. um, you know, of how, how we can do that. I mean, I... I would think the theatre, I don't see why a theatre can't provide the piece of kit I was talking about. Because um, they're the large enough, I would have thought there could be space somewhere for it to be stored. Um, again, speak to the fire and rescue services, have a chat with them. But if they say to you that, yeah, we're well, all right, we will get the person out, you can leave them in the refuge, we will get them out. I would ask for that in writing. If that's what they say, if they say they will help you and they will do that, ask for it in writing. Because if they don't give you it in writing, you know what would happen should the worst ever occur. Nobody will own up to say, yes, that's what we agreed to. Yeah, I know we have, I mean, I certainly the staff at the LA have received the training, um, you know, to operate the evacuation chair, but I know, I suppose myself, Physically, I would be unable to take someone down, yeah. um, you know, down the stairs with the, using the evacuation chair. So, and there are a few of us who, who Where, would feel the same. In the theatre, are the wheelchair accessible spaces? Are they? Do you have to use steps to get to them normally, or lift? Well, we have the lift basically, yes, to get yeah. up to the first floor. Right. Is it evacuation lift? Do you know, or platform lift? Um, no, it's just um, just not a passenger lift. It's just passenger right. lift, yeah. yeah. It's not a firefighter's lift, then. No. No. No, right. No, you you'd have to have a look at um, using a piece of equipment that will pick up a wheelchair. That you, then, in that case, a stair climber that will take somebody down the stairs. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Anything? Please. <laughs> I, want to, I don't want to make sure everybody's falling asleep. Ian, how much would one of them units actually cost? That stair, stair climb? They're, they're, they vary. I think they start at about four or five thousand pounds and they'll go up to ten, ten thousand or more. There is a company, if you just bear with me a second, make sure I get the. Uh, there is a company called Eva Access. Um, I've, I'm not plugging them. I, I can't vouch for them or anything. 
but I've used the information on their website, which is very good. And that is E V A double C E double S. They're based in England. Um, I'm sure they will give you advice. Uh, I've got colleagues who have used them in the past, uh, but there's all sorts of information on, on their websites about different bits of kit that you can use. Okay, Ian, can I ask you something else? And I know I just uh, sort of missed it, so maybe you may have covered this already. Um, with regards to accessible seating, because um, we're looking at um, the development of an outdoor space um, within the theatre. So I just, have you information on um, the types of accessible seating and, and what it is, or if you have any examples, would you mind maybe sending that through to us? When you say accessible seating, do you mean like the picnic benches I was talking about early on? Or... Yeah, I suppose it needs to be mobile as well. So, right. um, yeah, um, because obviously, it, yeah, we have to be able to move it because just to uh, accommodate different um, events and, and workshops and things that we're going to be obviously having holding in that space. But the seating has to be accessible. Um, right. And I know, I suppose, I know um, there are a number of people who have asked, so what is accessible seating in terms of, you know, um, people who are going to be looking after this for me? So have you got examples of that? I haven't got examples, but all I would, I can tell you what you need to be thinking about. But in essence, it's about providing a range of seating. So provide some, you, I don't know what it is you're doing outside, but you might have some benches. If you're providing benches, provide some with backs some with armrests, provide some single seats, okay. just provide some stools. And it's just about providing a range of seating. And if you're setting it out formally, you might be setting it out in an amphitheater style, curved style, or it might be like a classroom or whatever else. Just make sure there are some spaces amongst it so that people with assistance dogs can sit with the dog alongside them and wheelchair users can get in there. So there's not one seat style that will tick all the boxes. It's just about providing a range of styles. That's that's the secret to, to doing that. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful, Ian. Um, and also thinking about the heights, but I'll jot some notes down and I'll email them across to Louise. And okay. If she'll kindly forward them on to you, I'll give her a job to do. <laughs> thank you, Ian. Look, we're running out of time here. We have... Um, you know, something else just happening now at two o'clock. Um, Ian, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your very comprehensive overview that you've given us within such a short period of time. And just to let everyone know, um, this is going to be uploaded as part of the program, okay, um, as originally uh, stated at the outset of the recording. Um, if there's any further questions, I'm sure, Ian, um, it's okay for the individuals who participated today to, to go forward to you with, uh, with those um queries that they may have absolutely but thank you thank you Ian. and so just to conclude we will um send out to the powerpoint um uh, the presentation that was circulated and uh, utilized throughout today's um our session okay ian and if anybody has any queries um ian's information will be on um that uh, powerpoint that you will receive so I'd like to say thank you once again to Ian and thank you for everybody who participated and was very um, given. I hope that you got some uh, great um, insight into some access and inclusion provisions um, from this information session today. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you Ian. Thanks Ian.